Well, what I thought I'd do is um, I, I wanted to discuss all these artworks that use DNA as a medium. Uh, and I thought I'd, I, I just gave a talk here last night that is similar kind of in ilk, so I, I'm using the same slideshow that I used for that one. Uh, and I think it's similar enough. Uh, what I thought I'd do is explain the work kind of with this sort of more historical look at the intertwined, you know, scientific and political and legal histories that the work is responding to. Uh, I should say all this stuff, it, it's aiming to go beyond uh, a mere critique uh, and actually uh, create like a counter laboratory in the, in the Latourian sense, where, uh, where these truths can be refuted. You know, I, I use truths in quotes uh, here to say that uh, a lot of this history around fingerprinting, DNA, uh, fingerprinting, uh, anthropometry are kind of truths in quotes. Uh, here goes. 19th century science is a human difference. Modern sciences, uh, such as anthropometry, fingerprinting, genetics, and eugenics, served as tools of colonial empire. Uh, for instance, the use of fingerprinting in uh, colonial India uh, sought to amplify the disciplinary regime uh, by creating a biometric index uh, of the prison population. Similarly, in places like Jamaica uh, and parts of the Caribbean, uh, anthropometry is used in the service of eugenics uh, to maintain racial difference, uh, discourage the mixing. Uh, all these attempts to racialize work well with the kind of um, slavery economics of um, the, 19, uh, the 18th and 19th century. The history of fingerprinting and eugenics are totally intertwined. Uh, and it's tricky to provide an accurate history of them here, or an accurate one, because um, there are so many different people who have like, observed uh, <laughs> different pitches on the finger uh, as being di you know, different between individuals. But there's one person, uh, a fellow named Sir Herschel, um, Sir William Herschel. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for flipping. Perfect. Uh, one person from. Uh, so William Herschel uh, literally stands out. And it's because he's the first to implement it uh, in a disciplinary agenda. Uh, in India at this time, it's of course completely bound to the idea of race and criminality. Uh, and they even uh, had a, a, an act called the Criminal Tribes Act. They had a, big, a Criminal uh, Tribes Act of 1871 in which basically the caste system in India is augmented by a kind of new British colonial system that attempts to uh, stereotype each caste and subcaste as having certain criminal tendencies. Uh, so uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, Herschel instituted the um, use of fingerprints uh, near Calcutta. And initially, his idea was that this would be a way of preventing contract fraud. Uh, but then he quickly adopts it for the prison population. Uh, he, he proposes to, to broaden the system to all of India, but it, it doesn't fly. Uh, but curiously enough, uh, 10 years later, uh, Indian court would be the first ones to ever say that no two fingerprints are alike. So this unproven assumption uh, that's still unproven 100 years later uh, was first, um, was first um, validated uh, in the Indian courts. Um, fingerprinting then is explored by uh, Francis Galton, the cousin of Darwin, the father of eugenics uh, in the 1890s as a way of uh, discerning elusive physical markers of heredity, ethnicity, and race, as well as to establish identity. I presume people know about eugenics. Eugenics is the sort of pseudoscience of uh, race, uh, and the idea was to uh, improve the human race by uh, selective breeding. Um, so Galton is the, the father of that, by, by which he invents the term eugenics, meaning good in birth. Um, curiously, much like DNA is today, uh, fingerprinting was imagined by many to hold the hidden secrets of human identity, uh, propensity background. Um, 
But developments is made, and others as well. Uh, 20 years later, it became apparent that the fingerprint itself, this print, it had no inherent meaning. It was, it, it, it was not assigned, it was an index. Uh, it, so, so the use in, in criminal identification would be nearly indexical. It wouldn't give us any kind of clues to any kind of underlying character of an individual. So you can go to the next slide now. Uh, anthropometry would remain uh, the study, the standard for eugenic study. Uh, uh, things like arm length, cranial slope, uh, uh, various measurements of the jaw. Uh, would be used um, in this study by a guy named Charles Davenport, a uh, study called Race Crossing in Jamaica. Uh, in this case, he aimed to create a statistical evidence uh, for biological and cultural degradation, warning that uh, the grounds or the mulattoes uh, of Jamaica were less than the sum of their parts. That basically, you know, there's nothing wrong with the blacks nor the whites, they're different, uh, but each is, uh, the, the, each, each is different, but, but not necessarily inferior to one another. Whereas he really, he really looks at the Browns uh, as being you know, less than some of their parts. He, he recommends that, like, the only way that he could actually allow this kind of miscegenation would be if, like, hybrid flowers, you have a way of disposing of the ones which were uh, undesirable. Um, you can go to the next slide. Contemporary technosciences like the Human Genome Project uh, and DNA fingerprinting are direct descendants of these earlier counterparts. Uh, and they're similarly, similarly implicated in contemporary disciplinary use. Uh, they colonize new parts of the body, they, they go deeper. Um, uh, the Human Genome Project, uh, you can say enough, uh, in case people don't, don't know about this project, the Human Genome Project was initiated in the 80s, completed a rough draft in the year 2000, and the goal of it was to um, map every single gene in human DNA, and to create basically an entire sort of, uh, Frankensteinian corpus of uh, of an entire DNA sequence of uh, three billion base pairs. And this is what the Human Genome Project was, this massive kind of indexical library project. Curiously enough, uh, the project is initially entitled uh, Neo Neo-Eugenics. So it's put forth uh, to, for funding in the 80s as Neo-Eugenics Neo by a guy named uh, uh, Shinsheimer, Robert Shinsheimer. And if you go to the next slide, it's this fellow, um, James Watson, the uh, disputed uh, discoverer of DNA, who, <clears throat> who says, you know, listen, people get the wrong idea if we call it neo-eugenics. <laughs> they, might, they might think we're really nothing but Nazis. Um, so uh, so the, the Human Genome Project title remains. Um, so you can go to the next slide. By the year 2000, when the project's completed, uh, a team of UNESCO scientists uh, come to the kind of the optimistic uh, agreement that uh, there is no scientific basis for risk. Right? This was just a cultural con uh, concept, and that uh, scientifically now it can be proven that there's less genetic differences between the supposed races than there than there are uh, within. Right. So whenever you have more difference within than between, this by definition makes their categories uh, inaccurate. Uh, so there's no genetic basis for race. If you go to the next slide, Oops. Uh, what is um? Maybe yeah. The issue is a concern because uh, you know with the project form of being being so linked to, to eugenics. This kind of is like a, a, a big sort of side relief for a lot of the scientists and they are no longer maybe implicated in that specific um, endeavor. Do you go to the next slide? Uh, so with this history in mind, I mean, all my uh, artistic works uh, that I'm going to show, I, I use this technology uh, of DNA fingerprinting as my, as my, as my medium. Right? This, is the, this is the sort of key 
visual medium of human genetics, but contemporary genomics. Uh, and I, I basically use it that I, um, I appropriate the medium, and I, I kind of twist it in, in the ways in which it normally might be read. But this has become my chief medium as an artist for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, I'll tell you how it works. If you go to the next slide. Uh, basically, the, the DNA image is made by taking uh, an organism or you know, an individual's DNA, uh, chopping that DNA up into pieces, use, using something like a, a, an enzyme that might, say, cut the DNA in half or into certain fragments. Then, if you look at like, picture B in the this, in this same image, you can see that if you squirt that DNA into a small hole uh, in, a, in a gelatin, and then apply a voltage across the gelatin, the DNA would move uh, forward through the gelatin at a rate proportional to its, to its size. Uh, so you can see in, by, by, by E, uh, if there are two different size bits of DNA in your sample, you would then, in the DNA gel, have two different, uh, two different bands. Uh, and this is all the DNA images. It's like basically using a, kind of a differential sort of um, sieve or filter that, that, that shows the different sizes of, of DNA fragments in a way. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so the, the first project that I used um, this technology with uh, is a piece called the Relative Velocity Inscription Device. The idea was basically to um, uh, extract to, to extract skin color genes from my family who are incidentally of Jamaican descent. So we are as a family basically these sort of second order uh, subjects of a test like Davenport's race crossing in Jamaica. Uh, we are uh, we, we are the Browns that then came and further intermarried to become these sort of light Browns. <laughs> uh, and so I thought it would be interesting to try to reproduce Davenport studies in my own family but using a more contemporary medium like DNA fingerprinting to kind of show how it was also subject to the same sort of metaphorical interpretations that the body was uh, in the earlier study. Uh, so I invited the family over to dinner, uh, introduced them to a, a doctor friend of mine, uh, and said, you know, I want to extract the skin color genes for this, for this special project. Can you go to the next slide? The project was, uh, once I got the skin color genes, the, the idea was that they would be inserted into a really large DNA fingerprinting gel. The, the actual term for this <clears throat> isn't DNA fingerprinting, it's really gel electrophoresis. The process of, of seeing how the speed of the DNA might move through a uh, porous matrix like a gel. And so in this case then, uh, the idea was to insert all the family members, mother, father, sister, brothers, uh, skin color gene fragments, uh, and then go to the next slide, and to basically race them against one another. So to make a sort of race which was about this. Uh, uh, see which genes would move the fastest. Right? Jamaicans, you know, are known for their sort of for their speed. You know, we like win Olympics and things like that. So the idea was to see which uh, which DNA moved the fastest. Presumably, because if, if you follow the, the, the metaphor here, you know, the pun, that the fastest genes must be the most genetically fit. Right? <laughs> for measuring fitness. By the speed of DNA in a, a organic gel like this. Yeah, this is an inverted, this is a, a hack about on how the technology is going to be used. Normally, it would be, be used to try to differentiate by the relative position of DNA in a gel like this. But I sort of, as, as a medium, I'm playing with it as a medium to detect the yeah, speed. Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide. So this is, this projecting image just shows what the computer in the installation sees, which is a camera image, uh, which has these figures that have been placed behind it by the computer to help viewers see where they are. Uh, 
And so basically, this is the, the image that runs behind. Uh, so the notion was to like invent this race, which is about race, in which the body is in the race, basically, right? Uh, to look at this idea that, uh, you know, can racism exist when race does not, right? To think that maybe what happens if, if, if uh, the concept of race, you know, it, it might be scientifically disproven, but uh, will it just go molecular? Will, will race be still encoded within every cell of our bodies? Will, will we no longer sort of villainize the flesh? But will we now find, uh, you know, uh, racial stereotypes in these in these individual uh, genes of our body? Right? Uh, so basically, race leave the surface and uh, colonize the depth. Uh, you know, who knows? I mean, this this was a, a pessimistic way of reading uh, reading the project. But curiously enough, if you go to the next slide, James Watson uh, described. The same month that my piece came out in a lecture at UC Berkeley, an experiment at the University of Arizona, in which uh, college students were given uh, injections of melon, which is you know basically the stuff that makes skin dark, uh, with the intent that you know if you stir a bunch of black stuff into these white college students, they won't get skin cancer. But if you'll see in the next slide, there's an unusual side effect. Pause up. The, the men develop these sustained and unprovoked erections. Which, um, which Watson explained, saying that, yes, you know, in fact, um, uh, at, you can go to the next slide. In fact, um, you know, you've never uh, <laughs> deceived Eric Piagra, because you don't even have to think about sex. You get this, sh basically, the shot of blackness. <laughs> uh, so that's why you had Latin lovers. You've never heard of an English lover, only English patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, what Watson does is, you know, in this era where race no longer exists, what he does is he takes the very stereotypes of the black body and he basically implants them at the genetic level, right? All the, what he's doing is he's saying every kind of cultural stereotype of the of the lazy oversex native can now be directly located not just in the genes but in the very genes that make us black, <laughs> you know, embedded at this deep level. Uh, all right, we'll go to the next slide. Um, like fingerprinting and eugenics. Uh, Fingerprinting is also tied to uh, a DNA fingerprinting. That is is also really directly tied to the racial project, right? The racialization. Uh, Sir Alec Jeffries is the inventor of the of the, tech, of the technology DNA fingerprinting, uh, and he's a, he's a population geneticist, and so he's also trying to discern racial heredity uh, with with the DNA image. Uh, only to find, just like Dalton, that this technology was not very good at that. Uh, however, uh, it was also, it might be good to differentiate individuals, even if it couldn't necessarily tell that, where they came from. Uh, many people are confused by this difference between fingerprinting and DNA fingerprinting, uh, which uh, I would say is totally intentional. Uh, uh, it's a clever metaphor, right? You, you have a new technology, you compare it to one which is already accepted in the court of law, and it kind of speeds things up a little bit. And indeed, you go to the next slide, uh, again, the inventor of the technology said, if I had called it what it was, nobody would have given a blind bit of notice. Call it DNA fingerprinting and a penny box. Right. Literally, Scotland Yard calls him up that month and says, "Hey, you know, let's um, you know, uh, let's put this to use uh, prosecuting people." If you go to the next slide, uh, just as Scotland Yard is infatuated, so is uh, the FBI in, in in the states. Right? Uh, the FBI fall in love with the metaphor. Right? They say, oh, "What we love about this? 
word DNA fingerprinting is it cements in the mind of the jury that we're identifying one individual to the exclusion of all others. Right? Magnificent. We've got this trope which is really, really effective to juries. Right? This is not something that we need to prove scientifically. You know, we it's all been done uh, in a word, in a metaphor. Uh, so, uh, if you go to the, uh, the truth is that, in fact, uh, with a DNA fingerprint, there are, there are thousands of different ways of uh, chopping up DNA into these fragments and making meaning or trying to individuate or differentiate with them. But shown in this slide are a bunch of things called enzymes which are referred to as molecular scissors. They, they will cut DNA at, at, at exact base pair sequences. Uh, and so they're useful if used, if used in certain ways to sometimes differentiate the spots where our DNA might differ. Uh, but there are thousands of them. And even, there's no, nothing inherent in the DNA fingerprint would require one set of enzymes as opposed to another. And in fact, every company that does this has a different copyrighted enzyme or primer or probe which makes a DNA image. Uh, so there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of different ways to make them. Uh, I wanted to take advantage of this in this next piece called Lake to the Protocol. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is how it works. You have these enzymes that I just showed. This is, um, this is a DNA map of an organism called plasmid. And you can see it is mapped by the places where an enzyme would cut into the pieces. Uh, you go to the next slide. Thus, if you use, say, two enzymes, uh, like the two that are highlighted there, uh, I forget which ones they are. One is APO1 near the bottom uh, corner, and the other is like BAM H1, I think, near the top. Uh, if you were to add those two enzymes to a solution of this DNA, and then go to the next slide, you would effectively cut that DNA into two, in, in two places and, to, and produce two different sized DNA fragments, right? Uh, so if you have bucket loads of this organism's DNA, you have like a, a million copies that are quite big and a million copies that are the smaller piece. Um, this is kind of the simple as that. It's kind of a simple technology if you can get your head around this idea. If you go to the next slide, then we have those two different sized bits of DNA, uh, some of the big ones, some of the little ones, and you squirt them into the gel, you see you get two bands. Right? Uh, this was my theory behind this next work, the way I would make this work. I thought in theory then, uh, if, if you have thousands, you have hundreds of thousands of different ways to cut this up, uh, if you go to the next slide, I should potentially be able to make any image I want out of any DNA that I, that I receive, right? There are hundreds of thousands of different ways of doing it. And to aid in that, I would just have, I would just put uh, any given DNA sequence into a, a program I wrote, and then basically uh, try, basically have that program, uh, if I put an image in, be able to kind of virtually test every combination of enzyme uh, to see uh, how far, you know, how it would cut DNA and how far the piece would move, right? Uh, so it's just a simple thing where you try the hundreds of thousands of different combinations uh, and it would statistically compute which one, which way might make the picture I wanted to. Uh, the notion here is that um, I want to create the DNA fingerprint is the most culturally authoritative image we have, right? It's the difference between a free person and a, and, and a prisoner, right? It is what's called the gold standard for criminal um, identification. It is a thing that, that when you have DNA evidence against an individual case load, uh, more authoritative than any other thing we have, more, certainly more authoritative than a photograph. <clears throat> uh, you go to the next slide. So I wanted to take the most authoritative image we had uh, and show how that image was not natural, it was just a cultural construct. Uh, one image among many uh, that, that could be made. Uh, 
In doing so, you'll notice I wear, I'm not dressed like a scientist, I'm dressed in all black, like an artist. <clears throat> because I realize that artists have this funny sort of tendency that any medium that we work with, we tended to make seem uh, less authoritative. Right? The minute the artists start really playing with cameras, uh, are the moment that people start saying, oh, you know, the camera thing should apply. Right? Artists are fundamentally just untrustworthy, uh, and the kind of amount of plasticity that they can create in the medium, the ways that they can stretch it, make it say different things, are what make it so, make people so skeptical of that medium. So I chose to uh, not only keep, but actually augment my sort of artist presence in this work related to the protocol. The, the idea was here was to um, basically to dispute the kind of omnipotence of that, of that most powerful authoritarian image. So I do the things, in, I do the processes in front of audiences, you can go to the next image. Uh, <clears throat> you can see I'm, I'm inserting into gels. I decided that what would be most interesting would be to always make two pictures of the same organism DNA, uh, two, two identical bits of DNA processed in two different ways to sort of further underscore uh, the plasticity of this medium. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so you can see there's cameras above, next slide. And the way the piece worked then is that the cameras just captured the live gel of the DNA uh, and show these different pictures. The idea was to make the pictures like, uh, you can go to the next slide. And you need to leave it there for a second. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide. The, the idea was to make the, um, <clears throat> the images uh, be, 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 be cultural symbols, right? Normally DNA images are just abstract barcodes, like things. The idea here was I wanted to make every image look like our kind of cultural expectations uh, or associations to DNA. So we associate DNA with copyright. So we, so we associate DNA with copyright. You can go to the next picture. Uh, we associate all these biological organisms with sort of terror and fear. Uh, we also get the image of the skull and bones. The skull and bones were the kind of favorite uh, measurement tools of the, of the previous era, the epithmorphic era. Uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the associations with DNA. You can go to the next slide. This one, this one's strange, it's probably too tricky to talk about. Uh, it's a chicken and egg. Uh, <laughs> you might imagine what the meanings of those are. <clears throat> I should note that in all these pictures, they're all like open source, right? You can see every picture has its recipe uh, down below. With the idea being that anybody who wants to reproduce this image can, uh, and that this, as a kind of counter proof to the kind of notion of the DNA image being essential, in this kind of counter proof, the idea was to um, uh, to make sure that anybody who didn't believe me could reproduce it. Right? If, uh, I'm making this big critique, but likewise, I'm going to give all the information uh, to make sure that, like, where I'm saying. So I invariorize the image. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to look back a little bit historically here. But in the, by, the, um, by the 1990s, mid-1990s, the DNA wars in this country were set to be over. That is, the kind of question that, like, is DNA uh, technology uh, can be accepted as a, as a fact in the courts. Uh, and indeed, at that time, it was the gold standard of criminal investigation, where I refer to it, the prosecutor's like the, like this, this thing that like has the capability of just instantly turning free person into people. So what does all this have to do with the, um, with the white Ford Bronco, uh, which uh, became what I call a, uh, a white screen atop which the, uh, the largest U.S. television audience, live television audience ever uh, to project their fantasies, right? So white screen of the Bronco. Uh, you can go to the next image. 
uh, I, I I got interested in this I'm, in looking back at this case because I remember that um, the news media had showed all these images to show how simple DNA imaging was and uh, kind of showing like how the jury must be you know uh, kind of reverse racists uh, to not be taking this evidence uh, seriously. But I found these kind of images all in a place called the, um, uh, oh, can you see me? Yeah, I cannot see you, no. Oh, sorry, yeah, I can. okay. I can, I'll, I'll put myself up again. Uh, I found all these kind of images in a place called the uh, O.J. Simpson Forensics Archive at Cornell University. I found uh, probably, probably almost a hundred of them in print. Curiously, those aren't O.J. Simpson's DNA image. Those are promotional images created by the company that did the work to show how simple the technology is. Uh, the O.J. Simpson image, although offered to newspapers, was never taken. It was always a, the, the, the company's promotional image used. So if you go to the next image, I, uh, I eventually tracked down the image in uh, the actual trial image in uh, the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And I, uh, I was fascinated to find, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but I did promise to them, I said, you know, in, uh, you know, that I would only be using it for this artwork. <clears throat> and that uh, I thought then, I didn't feel right about making <clears throat> even, even sort of digital copies of it uh, for other work. I really just wanted to use it just for this project. And I thought I would use that to make the next project. So I thought, okay, I won't make a digital copy of this image. But what might be kind of an interesting thing to try would be to make a reproduction of this image. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is a device called the DNA thermal cycler. Maybe I won't talk about that. That's the technology I'm using to kind of basically to do this project. And uh, the project, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so, so what I decided to do was to <clears throat> basically uh, not to make a digital copy of this, but to try to make a copy of the image. And to try to copy that image using only my own DNA. Essentially, to make almost like a master study, the way that, again, I'm going to invoke the idea of an artist here. Uh, and artists often uh, learn their, their trades by going to museums and like literally painstakingly copying a painting. Uh, I wanted to do exactly this with this trial image. To better understand the meaning of the OJ Simpson time, I thought, well, I should, I should sit and um, and make a, make a copy of this image, but again, not using a brush, not using a digital copy, but taking my own DNA and processing it in such a way that I could play the part of all the victims, all the suspects uh, in the OJ Simpson trial. I wanted to play the part of you know black man, white woman. Uh, you know, victims and unknowns. Uh, so I set out to do this, you know, basically also in front of the audience's eyes. You can go to the next slides. Uh, <clears throat> maybe the next one. Here are some test images. And then maybe go to the next one. <clears throat> the idea was, just like in Lake Peter Protocol, I wanted to do this all in a public theater. And, uh, with this, it was important that I collaborate with uh, my former assistant, a, a, a woman named Carrie Sheehan. She, um, she was working with me in that, you'll see in the former client, I guess, that she was in this. Uh, she, she, was, uh, she went down after being my intern, basically, in the lab, to being a law student in Boston. And uh, realized in this piece it would be fun to make the image in front of audiences to let them ask questions, but to not distinguish between questions which were technical and, te and questions which were like political and, and legal. And that these are all part of the kind of, you know, strange imbroglio that DNA imaging exists in. Right? If we don't have image, DNA imaging in, trial, in court because it's scientifically a great thing, but we have it in court because the metaphor was really very powerful and jury accepted it. Uh, so we have these conversations with people, uh, and basically uh, we uh, we try to make a, a master copy of this of this image. You can you can kind of flip back and forth between this image here 
and the, and the original DNA image. You'll see it's pretty close. It looks a little different because I can't use radio right? radioactive probes in a gallery. So it's got a slightly different, the marks have a different character. But most of them are actually in the right spots. They just have a different character. <coughs> the reason got, I was interested in... We've this, got two minutes. I, th I think I'll, I'll basically end it here. But I'll say that what, was in, what interested me about the O.J. Simpson trial uh, images, uh, or the O.J. Simpson trial, was that it's the first case where the prosecutors ever have this much DNA evidence against a person. Yeah, it's the first case where some egos isn't convicted. Uh, it's the, the, the uh, defense team that was working uh, hired by O.J. Simpson would then even go on to form a thing called the Innocence Project, which used DNA testing to, to exonerate uh, death row inmates. So the trial becomes kind of a turning point. It's the first moment where like DNA can be possibly <laughs> uh, in the court of law. And it's not just a kind of uh, total kind of prosecutorial authoritative, uh, omnipotent technology. And all this work has been then, that, that I've shown today, it's been trying to kind of degrade the authority uh, it's been attempting to show that uh, genetic codes have little to do with identity or fitness. Uh, the genetic images aren't, ass aren't essential, that they're cultural constructs, literally built in labs. And the DNA images are malleable, memeable, and their authority can be challenged. So, um, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs>